Now, my name is Dr. Gia Dalagana, and I am a research associate at the Wells Governance Center at Cardiff University, where I am specifically working on the role of policy networks in cross-border cooperation between our Wales and the island of Ireland with Professor Daniel Wincott. We have also recently published a policy report on the Interreg Ireland Wales program. Well, let's say I've always found quite hard to believe that the shape that cross-border relations will take after Brexit has been especially thoroughly neglected, both academic and also politically. But however, Brexit has implication for the territorial governance of the North Atlantic archipelago, in which uh, the UK and Ireland bulk large. So to restrict the social spatial implications uh, of Brexit to the UK territorial state alone is to leave out key aspects of the changes it will bring. So the question me and Professor Winkert have come to ask ourselves for uh, this research is specifically how did the Irish Sea came to be constituted as a cross-border region. And we, are, we were interested in issues of core periphery relations, borderlands, uh, how actor in distinct places access the region's resources, scale divisions of labor and partnerships. So although the resources that the Interreg Ireland Wells program provides are relatively small for good or ill, the Ireland Wells region exemplifies a form of social spatial governance that tends to the center territorial states. In the ever present shadow of hierarchy, notwithstanding as supported and empowered policy networks in distinct and often otherwise neglected places. And these emplaced policy networks are, we argue, an important aspect of a pattern of spatial meta-governance constituted by the European Union. So this is also why Jonathan asked me and invited me to chair this panel today. Uh, and I am extremely grateful and extremely honored to do so. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our very own speakers for this session. In no particular order, We'll have um, Aoife Dowling, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation of Irish names, <laughs> I'm Italian. So. Um, and Aoife is the project man manager of the initiative uh, Port Past and Present. She's based at University College Cork. She has a BA in History and Greek and Roman Civilization from UCC and a Master in Cultural and Creative Industries from King's College London. Before joining par, uh, Port Past and Present, Eva was deputy editor of the video team at Storyful, a social media news agency in Dublin. Her role on the project combines her interest in project management and cultural heritage. Then we will have Dr. Philip Crowd. He is an assistant professor in climate responsive design at UCD School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. And the and the UCD School of Civil Engineer. Philip is a co-founder of the nation UCD Center for Irish Towns, a transdisciplinary center for research and collaboration, and co-chair of the innovative and social enterprise at the UCD Earth Institute. Philip's background is in architecture and urban planning, and he is the co-principal investigator with Dr. Karen Foley of the Interreg Garland Wells Initiative, Coastal Community Adapting to adapting together. Lucy Taylor is the project manager of the LIVE project, which aims to expand a sustainable environmental tourism model on two peninsulas in Ireland and Wales. Lucy worked in a range of roles in education, training and writing before returning to university to study marine biology. Since then, she has worked in research management and communication for the University College Cork. She was also the lead author, author and photographer for Ireland Seashores, a field guide, which is an identification guide to the plants and animals of the Irish seashore for a general audience. 
Siobhan McGovern has worked in art, heritage and community project for the past 20 years in Pembrokeshire. She fundraised and managed a community heritage pro project to conserve, excavate and interpret the most preserved medieval pottery kiln in the UK, which is situated in Newport Pems with a strong community and schools program. And most recently, Siobhan was part of the Span Art team working and delivering live events and well-being project. And she has now taken over from Rowan Matheson on the Ireland Wells Rediscovering Ancient Connection project. And last but not least, Dr. Sarah Davis. She is the head of the Department of Geography and Earth Science at Upper Street University. Her research focuses on reconstructed past climatic and environmental changes using evidence from lake sediments and peat deposits. She has worked in a diverse range of environments, including the Subatlantic Islands, Mexico, and Ethiopia, along with sites closer to home. Sarah is also, has also used the documentary records to investigate historical weather extremes, and she is coordinating the Upper Street University Cherish Surveys team and will be developing records for, of past storm activity and climate change from coastal lagoon, pit deposits, and sand dunes. She will also be working with colleagues to in investigate historical storms and associated impacts in the Cherish project areas. Before going to our discussions, I just want to remind a few households rule. Um, raise your hands if you want to ask a question and uh, please feel free of course to ask it directly but if you feel too shy to do so just uh, type it in the chat and we will be more than happy to to address it uh, for you and without further further ado i'd like to leave the stage to ifa thank you very much jaza and jonathan for the invitation to this round table. It's very lovely to be here and to be here with other Ireland Wales programme projects also. Uh, so I must add at the outset our funding acknowledgement, which is that our project is funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland Wales Cooperation Programme. And that's why myself and the other projects are here today. In terms of our project, the goal of our project is to increase tourism at port location through heritage, working with local communities and basing our work on strong academic research. The partners that are involved in the Ports Past and Present project are ourselves at University College Cork, where I am based and where my colleague Jonathan is also based, who you may have um, encountered at, at earlier stages of the conference if you were here earlier. And the, the other partner in Ireland would be Wexford County Council. I see some of my colleagues from Wexford County Council here today. And then on the Welsh side, we have Aberystwyth University and the Centre for Advanced Welsh and Celtic Studies, which is part of the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. So a really great group of partners split between higher education institutions and strong academic specialty as well as with Wexford County Council, so really having good presence there as well. In terms of the project ports, our, our project ports are Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock. So really encompassing the Irish Sea Basin and indeed the ferry ports. In terms of where we're at, at the in the project at the moment, we are coming up to the we're coming up to the uh, close, close to the end of year two. So we're, we're kind of getting into a mature phase of the project at this stage. What, what has been a key focus of us for the past year or so has been really strengthening our relationships with communities at the ports. Of course, there have been challenges with that in terms of COVID. We've all had, had the similar, similar challenges, I think. We're, we're nothing new there. Um, but in terms of trying to really be innovative in how we reach out to communities, reaching out online and having focus groups online, having phone calls, email threads, really getting to work closely with people in those areas who are interested in heritage, who work in tourism, who are involved in local community groups, museums. We've really been able to encounter a great group of people through that. 
we have been able to work with those communities to create heritage stories on our, our platform, which is really building up to show the, the heritage and the rich stories across the Irish Sea. Ranging from photographs, a collection of photographs in the Dublin Dockers Preservation Society to individual stories from, we have a story from uh, somebody in, in Lismore, Dervla Murphy, a, a famous travel writer who traveled to Fishguard and many more kind of uh, community focused stories as well. And that's always building. We have a new story every Friday to keep an eye on our social media for that. We've also established a creative group, a, a group of creative practitioners from artists to writers who are working both within the, the port towns in some, some cases or indeed starting to work online with communities to create art related to the, the Irish Sea and the, and the ports. We're also, we also have an online tour, tourism network, which is a network of those who work at the ports, particularly in tourism and heritage or, or indeed who are interested in tourism and heritage at the ports. And we're starting to have conversations in a, an online workspace. So that's a new development as well. We've found that throughout COVID that community members have really uh, reacted positively to the opportunity to work with the project and have noted in, in some instances that it's been a lifeline for them. We're not kind of immune to the, the challenges of this period and indeed the, the challenge posed by Brexit as well. So in terms of um, our, the development of our project, that is something we are aware of. And we know that tourism is not going to be what perhaps we initially, initially envisaged as we started out in the project, that COVID has really changed things. So a big challenge for our project will be working with communities on those risks, make sure that we're, we're helping them to recover in, in the future. So that's it, that's it from me for the, the presentation. Thank you so much, Eva, for having uh, underlined the peculiarities of these uh, unique initiatives that actually seems really to bring together um, a mix between cultural heritage and also coastal cross-border elements. So let's now leave the stage to Philip to listen a little bit more about, well, probably the architectural and urban planning and climate elements of, the, of its initiative. Okay, thank you, Giada. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Great, um, you just never know when you're sitting in your, your home office. Um, so thanks a million for the, the opportunity to speak today. Um, it's great to hear from all the other projects on the Ireland Wales programme. Um, I should just say before I start this presentation, um, one of the, our project is basically looking at citizen engagement tools using digital technologies. Um, and this is one of those digital technologies. So this is a bit of an experiment. So it comes with a slight health warning. Um, so just to explain our project, um, the project is called Coastal Communities Adapting Together. So it has the acronym CCAT. Um, and as Aoife has done, I need to remind everybody that it is part funded by the ERDF through the Ireland Wales Cooperation Programme. I'm sure the logo is somewhere on this presentation. Um, it'll, it'll turn up somewhere. Um, and we are under priority access two, um, which is to do with increasing capacity and knowledge of climate change adaptation for the Irish Sea and coastal communities. And we are basically setting out to build adaptive capacity to change in those communities. But we're specifically looking at how do you build adaptive capacity using participatory activities. So that's based on the idea that it's critical to involve the entire community in identifying and understanding drivers of change over time um, and that active participation. So actually doing stuff can create deeper engagement rather than just talking to people and presenting material. So the types of activities that we're using are things like participatory mapping apps, geo games or serious games, geo design, which is on the left of the screen, which I will talk a little bit about later, um, and interactive learning experiences. The project was originally to be a mix of analog and digital activities, but obviously, as Aoife has alluded to, COVID has changed how we work on these projects, and so we are now default digital. Um, that has actually been 
more of an opportunity than anything else for this project. Um, there, are, there are a few activities such as field trips, which are challenging, but we're seeing it as an opportunity to really explore how do you engage citizens digitally with change in their environment, whether it's due to COVID or whether it's due to climate change. So we have six partners. We have a transdisciplinary consortium. We have Fingal County Council, um, so a local authority in Ireland. We have UCD, um, where, where I work. Uh, we have UCC down in Cork. Um, then we also have over in Wales, um, Pembrokeshire Coastal Forum, and the Port of Milford Haven, and Cardiff University. And we have two case studies, two case study areas. Um, the first one, um, well, it's not the first one, but the one in Ireland is um, the borough in Portran. Um, so this is uh, an area where there's a lot of coastal erosion and flooding. It's in the news a lot. And it's a special area of conservation. Um, and basically, um, the coastal erosion and flooding are threatening and destroying private homes in real time. It's happening at the moment, happens every time there's a storm surge. Um, so that presents the local authority with many challenges, such as the fact there's a lack of policy on coastal management in Ireland, um, and then unauthorized development and illegal dumping um, by residents trying to um, protect their own property. And then if I move over to Wales, to Pembroke Dock, um, to Milford Haven and Pembroke Dock. Here are very different challenges that our partners are experiencing. The port is making the transition from hydrocarbon industrial activities to renewable energy. And there's a very poor retention of young people. They need to keep young people in the area. So that's a challenge. And there's a lack of awareness of um, the potential of marine renewables in the area. So the this diagram uh, attempts to sort of show how all the different parts of the project are related. We're basically trying to move from a situation of low adaptive capacity to high adaptive capacity using the concept of coastal climate citizenship. And we have three pillars in the project under which all the activities happen. So we have observation, sense-making and co-creation, and they contribute to climate citizen initiatives. Excuse me, that's my phone. It always goes off at the wrong moment. Um, what do we mean by coastal climate citizenship? Well, basically, um, it's, it's easiest if we look at this diagram. This is led by Cardiff University. So they describe successful climate citizenship as having high levels of awareness and capacity to act and access to opportunities for positive behaviour change and a clear policy framework for, to support climate action. So I'm just going to introduce very quickly three projects um, under each of these pillars, observation, sense making and co-creation. So the first one is Map My Heritage and Port's Past and Present project will be very familiar with the location of this. So it's in Pembroke Dockyard, which has had various industries over the past 200 years. Um, but most recently, it is a, a marine energy centre and is now about to be transformed into a, a world class or as Boris Johnson might say, a world beating marine um, centre for marine energy. Um, it's, gonna, it's getting a huge grant from the British government um, or the Welsh government, and this involves huge changes physically and in terms of the industry that happens there. So it is necessary to bring the community along. So we are working with the Port of Milford Haven uh, to develop a participatory mapping project and a historical trail, so co-creating a historical trail with the local community. Um, and this will be a public amenity, it will be an a way to access places such as this little um, a gun tower that is inaccessible, but we can use things like AR to do that and reveal the past and future change in the area. So on this portal that we've developed, people are able to view the, tra the trail as it develops. They are able to um, map and see what other people have contributed. So I'm just going to go into the mapping portal so people contribute all these different things. Sorry, I just jumped. Uh, so they can go into this and they can look under different categories and see what people have contributed and they can add their own information. So uh, if we go in there, you'll see an entry someone's put in sort of, so it's all this information that's sort of invisible and it's distributed. And the idea is that it raises awareness and critically in terms of building adaptive capacity, it builds a sense of belonging and attachment. So 
a second project, a co-creation project, um, moving over to Fingal, and we've been exploring a, a tool called GeoDesign, which is designed for large scale complex multi-system and multi-stakeholder challenges where there might be conflicting perspectives and priorities so it suits um, areas prone to coastal erosion and flooding extremely well and um, what happens is people are put into groups and they are assigned different systems so those systems might be green infrastructure roads housing biodiversity etc and they co-create um, a series of solutions in simple diagrams like the on the screen now that are then overlaid on others and there's also a role-playing aspect so people have to come out of their own situation their own reality and see the situation from or the problem from another person's perspective so that might be taking on a persona of an older person or a child or somebody that lives there or someone that's visiting or someone in the local authority even and um, so basically it's a process of negotiation between systems and participants and stakeholders. So we've trialed this with UCD students. It's always vaguely safe to trial with students, first of all, um, but we also included people from Fingal County Council and we've been working with Fingal County Council staff. We had a meeting with about 25 of them last week um, to see if we can use this in a, in a real situation. And they are extremely interested in it because it does seem to potentially solve some pain for them. So moving on to a third project, um, which happened this week, a sense-making project. As I said earlier, uh, in Ireland, there's a, a serious policy gap relating to coastal management. Uh, Fingal County Council are dealing with the implications of that on the ground. Um, and there are policies and plans in place in other countries. For example, our partners in Wales have various um, mechanisms and policies, such as uh, shoreline management plans, um, so Cardiff University and Fingal County Council ran a webinar just this week, um, and Sarah, Sarah Davies is going to speak later, where the Cherish program, project um, was involved. I think, Sarah, you were on, you were on yesterday, yes. Um, so we put this on, it was divided into three sections. As you can see, there was a national policy section, a local authority section, and a community engagement section. Um, and the quality of the presentations were fantastic and we've got really good feedback from that and a really good attendance um, upwards towards 300 people. So that's about it for me. I, if, I suppose it's important to say that we are a pilot project, so we're just a two-year project. So we are actively looking for opportunities to continue this, this type of research. And there's a whole range of areas that are emerging from community participation through to um, managed realignment and nature-based solutions. So um, please follow us on our website and uh, on social media. And thanks for your attention. Thanks so much for this absolutely fascinating presentation. I'm sure there will be people and myself too that will have a lot of questions about this afterwards. But uh, let's first hear from Lucy Taylor and about uh, uh, the project uh, of uh, Eco Museums and the live project. Hi, thanks, uh, Giada. Um, yeah, so I'm the project manager for the live project which, like um, Quartz, is, is coordinated from UCC, um, University College Cork. So LIVE is an acronym of the Llyn Ivar Eco Museums. And we have three main goals. Overall, it's, it's basically a tourism project. Um, our goal is to establish an eco museum on the Ivar Peninsula, which is in the southwest of Ireland, in County Kerry. Um, and to expand an existing eco museum on the Llyn Peninsula in North Wales, which currently is a grouping of tourism attractions that focuses on the cultural heritage, mostly of the Llyn Peninsula in Wales. And we're hoping to add, to, to strengthen that by adding a kind of a new pillar focusing on the environmental heritage. Um, and the main output of the project is going to be a suite of digital resources and printable resources, but mostly, um, you know, tour guiding apps and digital information about the local environment of these two peninsulas. And then in the long term, what we're really hoping to develop within the project is a network in each region, but also between the regions and, and out to the, the broader, you know, British Isles and continental Europe of eco museums. 
Um, so that would be tourism providers, academic institutions, local government, community groups working together um, to, to kind of build on each other's experience of these sustainable tourism initiatives. Um, so eco museum itself is kind of a, a word that a lot of people have mixed reactions to. Um, so I'll just say briefly what it is. I mean, it's not very well defined as kind of a concept, but it is a very well established concept and there are a, a large number of eco museum initiatives around the world. So by using that word, we're trying to tap into that network a little bit as well. Um, and basically what an eco museum is, it's it's a community based model of tourism. So it's when communities come together to co basically to work on whatever their sense of place is and to use that to build an identity that they can then use to attract tourists. So it's kind of a co-marketing, co-branding exercise basically for a place. And quite often as the Eco Museum in Clean does, it's based on the, um, the cultural heritage of a location or maybe a specific aspect of that. But within this project, we're very much focusing on the environment. So um, like the previous two projects, we are co-funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. Um, and so our two regions are in Ireland and in Wales. Unlike a lot of those Ireland-Wales projects, Ireland -Wales projects, we're not two communities facing each other across the Irish Sea. Um, our region in Ireland is in the southwest in Kerry, so it's, it's pointing away from Wales. Um, but the, they are two peninsulas, the Ivar Peninsula and the Clint Peninsula. They're two peninsulas that have a lot in common in terms of their natural environment and their cultural heritage. They're both kind of outposts of, you know, native Celtic languages um, where those are still spoken and are still a key part of, of local identity and culture. Um, so they have a lot in common. And in terms of tourism, they're also linked by this kind of model of um, really, really high peaks of, of visitors in July and August for beach tourism and holiday homes. Um, but then it's very quiet the rest of the year and it can be very difficult for people to find really high quality year round work. And so they suffer a lot from young people leaving and not being able to come back once they've left for university. Um, they are also the real holiday home locations. So a lot of, they, they get a lot of domestic visitors but also international visitors. And obviously within the, the context of today's talks, how that will look after Brexit and now COVID is a real unknown for both of these regions. So making sure that they have very diverse and, and solid and sustainable tourism markets is really important for both of them. Um, so I suppose, although today is, is maybe more focused on policy and legalities of Brexit, what we're trying to do within the LIFE project is really to build a network. Um, so between Ireland and Wales, and also trying to include other partners in that. Um, we're working together with people in Scotland and continental Europe to, to kind of focus on that Celtic aspect of our shared cultures. Um, and so regardless, I suppose, of political situations and, and how things turn out next year, um, we're really hoping that we'll have such strong links that that, that won't fade, you know, even if, even if things are a bit tricky in terms of visas and moving products across the Irish Sea and all of that. Um, so just to say a little bit about specifically what we want to do in the project, and, and I should say that we are at the very beginning. Um, we've really only kicked off in September, although we've been kind of rumbling along most of this year trying to get set up with all the, the difficulties that 2020 has thrown at us. Um, so firstly, the project is really about local residents engaging with their own localities, with their own local environments and landscapes, and really focusing on the resources that they have to offer to visitors. Um, so within the project, at this point, we're really focused on that. We're looking at getting networks of local communities in Kerry and in Gwynedd in, in Wales to um, think about what it is they have, what they'd like to learn more about, the knowledge that they can share between themselves um, and really getting that engagement going. And obviously schools are a really big part of that and existing community networks. Um, Based on the knowledge gaps that we find then, we're looking at doing some, some research into some aspects of the environment, specifically geology and ecology, um, so that we can, we can fill in those gaps where local people don't already have the knowledge or the expertise. And then together, we're really looking at co-creating 
how we can, or co-creating the products we're calling them or, or offerings for visitors to the region. Um, and how we can really make those into a coherent offering so that each of these locations has an identity in people's minds. Um, because at the moment that can be quite fragmented. You know, people know the beach that they like to visit, but they mightn't really think of the communities and how they interact together and where those, what those places are to the people who live there as well. Um, then I suppose after the project, you know, we're, we're gonna be here for three years working together in our partnership and with the local communities. But what we're really hoping to leave is something that has been established, but that can become a bigger initiative so it should be owned by the local communities and you know we'll take a step back after the three years in the university um, and hopefully still be able to inform and do work with whatever eco museum is established in Kerry and and whatever is developed to build on the one in Wales but to make it sustainable through all of the shake-ups that tourism has had recently I think that community ownership and basing it on the assets that really aren't going anywhere um, in these these regions is what is important. Um, so that's that's what we're hoping to be able to develop. And we can't say what that long term future will look like because no one can see the future, but also because it's not up to us to decide. Um, so we're really hoping to just catalyze something within the communities that they develop and that they build on once once our funding has run out and the project has ended. Um, and yeah, and hopefully that will, will help them to be able to extend their season a little bit and focus on very niche tourism and a really kind of engaged model of tourism where people come to learn about the place where they are and where they really feel that they have been somewhere and that they've not just been away once they've been there. Um, and yeah, we hope that, that that'll really help these communities to face up to some of the challenges that are coming their way and, and also to, to give them some kind of sustainability and continuity in, in tourism, which is a massive industry for both regions and which could suffer but hopefully won't suffer too badly um, following Brexit as well. So that's all I have to introduce ourselves. Thank you so much Lucy. I think you really touched on uh, a number of elements that are really key also to all uh, interreg cross-border funding. One, it's the one of network as I said in my short introduction and um, also, I think it is important to remember that the place-based approach to, of Interreg allows areas outside the original geographical cross-border region to be eligible for funding. So absolutely, that is extremely interesting. And what it is really interesting also, it's to know how strategically those areas can be eligible. So maybe it's something that we can explore a little bit afterwards, but afterwards but before um, we leave the stage to another heritage pro uh, program and uh, to Siobhan McGowan. Hi there, um, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me and um, I just want to say I'm really hoping my computer doesn't pop off because the fan is whirling around which means it's overheating so if I disappear I'm really sorry. <laughs> Right, so yes, my name is Siobhan McGovern and I'm the project manager for Rediscovering Ancient Connections, The Saints, which is a collaborative cross-border arts and heritage programme linking six coastal rural, rural communities in North Pembrokeshire and County Wexford. So the project will re revive the ancient links between communities using our shared heritage of St David and his pupil and protégé St Aidan as inspiration. Um, the project is led by Pembrokeshire County Council in close collaboration with um, Pembrokeshire Coast National Park, County um, Wexford County Council and Visit Wexford and of course we're funded like the others by our ERDF. So I want to give a kind of general scope of our, of our project. So through a series of interconnecting arts and heritage projects involving communities, outside visitors, artists and heritage experts, the project aims to research and explore our shared heritage and history culture of the two regions and develop a story that strengthens links between Ireland and, and Wales. We want to provide opportunities for learning and skills development and experience sharing between communities and businesses in Pembrokeshire and Wexford. 
We want to generate new and improved cultural products in both regions to improve um, our tourist offer. Um, by products, I mean events, workshops, um, works of public art, animation, film, heritage attractions, etc. Reasons to overseas visitors through a destination marketing campaign, which implies you'll be missing out on half of the story if you visited one place and not the other half and attract more overseas visitors, particularly out of season, um, outside of high, high season. So really our aim is to motivate both communities to discover and well, really to rediscover our shared heritage, um, to be a mentor for each other, to share knowledge, experience and skills, and to use this to drive heritage and cultural based tourism to and between both of our ancient centers. So I want to give you a, a brief overview of our key deliverables. Um, so we have split our project up into eight different work packages. So very a quick summary of them. So we have um, the enterprise and innovation stimuli package and this is going to be set, um, this is going to take place in ferns and um, we'll be looking at creating a heritage center in their, in their community center. We've got destination marketing uh, work package which is marketing activity in both territories to encourage overseas tourists um, and there is a clear strategic link to work with the national tourism organizations in Wales and Ireland such as visit Wales and visit Ireland. We currently have a brief out. Um, the deadline for this is next Tuesday and consultation with stakeholders and, and communities um, and, and the public really help form that brief, which is to reflect the authenticity of the area, focusing on the people, real stories, you know, real people, you can meet real people uh, and our shared, shared heritage. Um, we have an arts and music festival um, uh, package, which has two parts. Firstly, um, it's to strengthen the existing festivals, um, which are already there through marketing and, and training uh, in marketing, and also to launch a Celtic Roots Festival, which will take place in St. David's, hopefully now in 2021. We have a um, traditional skills renaissance package, which is to develop public activities to two audiences. One is to visitors and locals to have a go session. And the, and the other one is to, um, to trades, trade people, um, you know, who will benefit from upskilling in order to create the next generation of skilled workforce necessary to maintain and enhance historic and traditional buildings. And, and craft techniques. We have a, another package called Exploring a Shared Past, um, where we commissioned Abata Heritage to research the story of the saints, which is now, which they have done, and it's this great big document, which is gonna be a great resource for the rest of the project. Um, there have been geophysical surveys and excavations of key sites um, in both Wales and Ireland, um, David Archaeological Trust, Dick Ventures and the Irish Archaeological Field Schools have, have already started some work on that. And indeed, we have um, historical folklore and genealogy, um, genealogical research for communities, you know, find out your heritage. Um, that obviously has been delayed, but we will start delivering that um, online um, in February. Um, we have another section of um, called Art Commissions, Interpretation and Access Improvement. And that is a series of um, public art commissions in both territories um, to create two major pieces of art on either side for a bit of a, a wow factor. Um, that's currently being commissioned at the moment. Um, it will go up to for a public consultation to see what people feel about that. Um, in addition to that, we have commissioned 10 artists from both sides who will be who just producing amazing work. I wish I had time to go into detail because it's really, you know, when you really brings the project alive when, when you hear that, but I'll be here all day, so I won't. But you'll have to believe me, it really does sound fascinating. Um, and the work this the work these artists will produce will will reflect the cross border stories and also create a very unique lens onto our respective counties, Pembrokeshire and Wexford. And it, you know, it will it will actually create incredibly rich um, material for the you know marketing assets in a way for the destination marketing marketing company to use. So 
that's good. Um, within that work package, there's also interpretation for existing sites um, and also some a, a big outdoor events um, with the first one we hope will be in May in Ferns. Another package is community-based projects and tourism ambassador schemes. Um, there's a range of community projects going on at the moment uh, with exchanges from communities back and forth the Irish Channel, which is really nice. Obviously, that's been delayed, but will hopefully happen. And then a tourist ambassador scheme, which involves training um, taxi drivers, hoteliers, shop owners in storytelling set telling and, and welcome a welcome host sort of thing. And then finally, um, animating schools. Um, we are producing short animated films to do a broadcast standard. Um, we're working with two schools in Ferns and St David's, and um, it's been delayed, obviously, because we can't have exchange trips, but it will carry on next year. So basically, we are just about a third of the way through in terms of time scale, scale but COVID-19 really has had quite a serious impact on our delivery with public visitor face-to-face -face things. Fortunately, we have been unofficially awarded an extension to the project for a further 15 months. So this will, the project will now finish in the summer 2023. And this will allow us to extend our delivery of our current project, as well as giving us a bit more scope. So as part of the additional support, um, from WEFO, we have identified two main additional areas to focus on, one being business support post-COVID, which will address the predicted fall in overseas visitors and support local businesses dealing with economic fallout post COVID-19. And the other is pilgrimage. Um, in phase one, um, we have discovered lots of stories of we of the early Celtic saints who traveled back and forth across the Irish Sea, inhabiting some of the wildest places in Europe and building important early religious centers. So a cross-border pilgrimage route linking the two regions is keenly supported by our partners, in particular a route which connects Ferns, the ancient capital of Leinster, home of the smallest cathedral in Europe and the ruins of St Aidan's Monastery, with St David's, the birthplace of St Wales, smallest city in UK and home to St David's Cathedral and um, Bishop's Palace. So with, with these two areas easily connected by the Stenoline Ferry Service, the rising interest in, in pilgrimage holidays and long distance walking, um, you know, we've both got stunning landscapes and our historical link between St David and St Aidan, the idea of this new pilgrimage joining these destinations is really quite compelling. Um, so what we will be doing, <clears throat> as well as the other things I mentioned, we'll be focusing on development, piloting and um, the promotion of this cross-border pilgrimage between these two destinations. Uh, we'll work closely with communities and businesses and stakeholders to kickstart this new product. Um, and the product will build to a crescendo in 2023, which will commemorate 900 years since Pope I cannot pronounce his name, but believe me, it was a pope. No, I'm not going to try. Um, he declared that two pilgrimages to St. David's were worth one to Rome and three were worth one to Dr Jerusalem. So um, there we are. So thank you for listening. I'm sorry if I went slightly over time. Thank you. Oh, voilà. Thank you so much, Siobhan. I'm happy that we share the same difficulties in pronouncing names <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. But also, well, I just want to make a positive comment because, of course, uh, this uh, context of COVID-19 has impacted uh, all of us in different ways, but especially I do think it's very difficult uh, to go on uh, on a project that is based on being together on workshop of meeting face to face uh, when basically this togetherness it's what now embody the real danger so it's really good to also see that extension are being allowed but also that there can be slightly changes to um, the focus of the project in order to help business communities and people to for, for what it will come next uh, which we hope all that it will be back to normality, but even in a better way. <laughs> so um, last but not least, uh, we call on the stage Dr. Sarah Davis on behalf of the Cherish Project. 
Hi, I'm just uh, sharing my screen um, so I can um, show you a few uh, few slides about the Cherish project. Okay, so thank you for the invitation to participate. And it's great to hear about all these other projects and, and thinking about the connections between what we're doing as part of Cherish and, and, and those other ERDF funded um, projects. So we're focusing on climate change and risks to coastal heritage um, on priority access, access two. Um, we've been going for almost four years. We started in January, 2017. Um, and it's a five year project initially. Um, with, with 5.1 million euros of funding. Now this year has been significantly disrupted like everyone else by COVID. Um, so we've been able to secure a, a, a six month extension to phase one, um, but we also have an additional year of funding which will focus on um, uh, policy engagement um, and developing outputs for schools and businesses um, from the work that we've been doing over the course of the project. So we're, we're, we're focusing on a, a whole range of um, different aspects of it the um, impacts of climate change on coastal heritage through mapping and monitoring um, change following extreme events or over the course of the projects. And that provides a baseline of evidence that can be used in the future to monitor change over the longer term. Um, we are putting together plans for managing specific sites that are at risk. We're um, uh, staging interventions through excavation and, and more detailed studies of sites which, which are at risk. And, and the, the aspect that I'm more involved in is looking at the longer term history and how does the, the, the climate change that we're experiencing at the moment and um, putting that into a context over historical time periods and even further back over past millennia. We, we, we live and work in these very dynamic landscapes and having that longer term context is, is very important. Now, I think it's fair to say that um, the historic environment and, and heritage hasn't really featured strongly in the climate change debate until recently, but there is now an, a growing engagement in the policy sector um, in, in terms of how um, climate change is impacting on heritage, not just coastal heritage, but uh, across all of our um, territories. But, but um, also just thinking about how climate change, how, how coastal heritage can be used as a way of engaging uh, communities in the climate change conversation. So it's a, it's not simply a, a sort of policy and impacts process, but actually using heritage as a vehicle to discuss the impacts and challenges that we're, we're facing today. And of course, when we think about the coasts and climate change, the first thing we think about is storms and extreme events. And we've had a, a few stormy years. Um, and I think that's something that we share across our two uh, regions across the Irish Sea. We, we experience similar weather patterns and, and um, have the same kind of challenges around our coastal communities. And it was really the, the winter of 2013-14, which is the strongest, uh, the stormiest winter on, on record in the, in the British Isles, which, which um, really focused our, our minds. And I think we think of climate change as a, a kind of broad kind of entity. We're talking about global temperature change, but it's actually what we experience locally, which makes us really you know, realize the importance of climate change to us. So it's very much, you know, the, these local weather extremes and how that they're a representation of a broader climate change issue and, and how they're played out locally and, and the importance of locality and place um, does, does come through very strongly in, in coastal um, climate change and, and heritage impacts. Climate change um, can impact on coastal heritage in a range of ways, although storms uh, and, and sea level rise are really the the, the obvious one through through inundation and, and extreme impacts, but the increased rainfall intensity that we're experiencing as, as the climate warms can also bring the, um, you know, impacts on coastal heritage from an onshore rather than an offshore um, source as, as well. Rising temperatures um, can potentially impact on um, changing the, um, the, 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 the species range in, in in the marine environment, which might impact on submerged heritage, for example, but also um, uh, more droughts that we're seeing over, over the, the summers, like in 2018, can reveal heritage um, that, we, that is previously undiscovered. And it's not a, it's not a one way street in terms of loss. Uh, we think of erosion and, and damage and destruction, but actually these coastal processes can, can bury heritage or, or uncover um, previously undiscovered heritage. And I think that the links between climate change and coastal heritage do feed into 
um, things like the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act that we have here in Wales in terms of thinking about um, sustainability, language, culture and, and creating cohesive communities which are resilient to um, future change. We're using a, a range of um, different techniques from land, sea and air, which involves airborne um, monitoring, high resolution, um, fine scale monitoring of specific sites, and then also digging further deeper into the past to explore a whole range of, of different sites. Um, in the, and the Welsh sector, we're working at sites from um, the eastern coast of Anglesey, right the way around to Stackpole in South Pembrokeshire, and in Ireland, we're working on a series of sites from Dublin Bay down into southeast um, Ireland in, in Wexford and Waterford and then over into Kerry as well. The sorts of sites that we're looking at are often quite remote and rugged and, and quite spectacular. So this is quite a visual um, project and, and we're monitoring change. These are just some examples of the, the coastal promontory forts that we are investigating in, in Pembrokeshire. Um, and these are popular with walkers. They're often protected sites, either through um, scheduled ancient monument status or al also often within protected areas for, for nature conservation. So we're bringing together the cultural, natural heritage and some tourism aspects as well, um, which, which feed into some of the other aims of, of the other projects that we've been hearing about. So we're looking at specific sites and, and they're investigating sites at risk, but we're also taking a landscape approach and looking at different aspects across broader areas. And, and this is one area of North Wales, which has been a major focus for us over the last few years, um, where we're looking at lake sediments, sand dune systems, um, buried archeology span underneath the sand dunes and um, exposed uh, hill forts, which are um, showing um, quite serious signs of, of erosion and where we've been able to take in um, archeological investigations involving communities. So we can actually put this coastal heritage and climate um, coast, you know, the changes that we're seeing in coastal heritage into a much broader landscape context and use that as a way of engaging with coastal communities about how dynamic these environments are. Um, you know, we often think about trying to kind of preserve things as they are um, and, and to protect against climate change. But when we take take a step back and take the longer view, actually, these these environments have constantly been changing and, and evolving over time. And, and, you know, sharing that message, I think, is an important part of of how we adapt to climate change in the future. As well as the onshore record, our colleagues at the Geological Survey of Ireland uh, are doing detailed um, work on, on the submerged heritage as well. They're providing high resolution um, uh, imagery which connects the offshore record to the onshore record so we have a more complete and continuous picture, but also focusing on specific shipwrecks. Um, and some of the products that we're developing through the course of the project mean that we can bring some of this more remote heritage, which is inaccessible or submerged, um, into, um, you know, in, into the public realm more effectively, which can help you know, in terms of promoting areas for tourism, but also our understanding of how these environments are changing over time. So that's a very quick whistle-stop tour of, of, of um, uh, what, what we've been up to and, and, and the aims of our projects. So monitoring and understanding change over a whole range of timescales from individual storm events that we've seen during the course of the project through to um, past millennia. We're, we're uh, you know, um, narrowing down and investigating those sites at risk to understand them before they are damaged or lost um, for the future. And using that information and evidence that we're gathering to um, to um, have that conversation with, with coastal communities. And I think it's important to say that it's not just a one way street in terms of that communication and us sharing our knowledge. Coastal communities have living, been living with climate change for a long time. They care about their heritage. They understand um, the, 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 the challenges of extreme weather. And we can learn a lot from those communities about how they've, how they've adapted to change over time as well. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this fascinating presentation. It's, uh, well, it's uh, absolutely fascinating to see how history can be connected to climate change because it is something that is not uh, that often 
done and it's great to see that uh, work is being done to foster this knowledge among people and especially people in the cross-border region so now we have uh, uh, more or less half an hour for uh, questions and i see jonathan as his end up so i'll <laughs> jonathan <laughs> thank you giada i'm abusing my position as, as the conference organizer a little bit um but i just want to <clears throat> thank all of the contributors um, and also to flag that there are uh, other um, Island Wales projects that, that, that uh, could have could have taken part today but I, what I wanted to try and do was was demonstrate a kind of uh, give a sense of the broad range of um, projects that are funded through the Island Wales project uh, as well as some of the overlapping uh, as well as distinct themes uh, that those projects deal with and cover. And, and one of the reasons that I thought foregrounding the Island Wales programme as, as part of a larger um, set of, um, you know, uh, of funding packages that are provided by the European Union for coastal and fishing communities in, in Ireland is that I'm, I'm interested, I suppose, in, in the panellists' view on this is my sense is that the Island Wales programme is perhaps a little unloved and a little and uh, publicized. Uh, I wondered if that's a fair um, representation of the Island Wales program. I think it's something that came out very strongly for me in the report that you mentioned at the outset, Giada, that Giada and, and our colleague Dan have, have uh, recently published on the Island Wales program as a, a really dynamic, innovative, interesting uh, form of cross-border cooperation between Ireland and Wales which seems at the moment in the eye of the Brexit storm, if you like, to be particularly significant. So I wondered whether that's had any kind of practical implications for the project, whether you've had to work harder to, to, to work on publicizing the project, on engaging communities with the project and what strategies have developed around that. And I'd also like, I also wonder um, if you have any reflections across all of these projects on the potential consequences of Brexit for the legacies of these projects, that, that this new border that is liable to emerge in the Irish Sea, what, what potential consequences does that have for the kind of enduring consequences of each of your product, projects? And is there a way maybe we could work together to mitigate that in some way or what strategies might we develop to, to overcome that in some way. So apologies for abusing and asking, uh, abusing my position, asking uh, a number of questions there, but thank you all very much for some fascinating presentations. Okay, who wants to take the stage? And then I see that there is another hand raised and I will address that question just straight afterwards. So. I, I can um, come in on the, the Ireland Wales being an unloved um, program, maybe just with um, with an observation that I suppose, as I mentioned, our region in Ireland is not facing Wales, as so many of, of you know, the other communities that are involved might be. Um, and so I suppose for us to go to communities in Kerry and tell them that we're expecting them to partner with communities in Wales, it's it's a little bit out of the blue for them. It's not such a natural kind of link um, and, and there are really clear things that both regions are going to gain from this cooperation um, but it's definitely not a kind of an, an existing link in people's minds um, I don't think that they they kind of they remember Wales sometimes as, as a sort of a Celtic neighbour as well and I suppose you know while other communities in Ireland may be would cross over to Wales on the ferry more often or might consider it a place to move to. My, my thoughts from the southwest are that you know we tend to think of America and London maybe more and not so much Wales. So I think it's a really nice, it's, it's really, really positive that we're, we're able to join in with this programme and to link communities in these two peninsulas that have so much in common but possibly had never heard of each other before. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think it's it's a really positive thing, but I that the communities that I'm working with haven't encountered this program before, I would safely say. So 
if I can just uh, jump in one second. Well, what I also discovered when studying the, the program, the Interreg Ireland Wells program, was the fact that, well, first of all, it's a little bit more difficult to raise awareness among people of across border regions that has not a land border, because even geographically, it's a lot easier to see, okay, that's the cross border region, there is a land border, while this is a maritime cross border region built around the strategic importance of the Irish Sea. So, and the, it has been a region that has been built bottom up, uh, top down by the European community, which again meant that first the cross-border region was built and then networks established themselves to raise awareness among people in the cross-border area about the, the existence, same existence of the region. So that might be also one of the reasons why, well, it is less known and less, let's say, popular, while it is a real example of how an interreg pro program can actually empower policy networks on a cross-border basis. Philip, you wanted to come in? No, also Shivan, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I, no, I, I suppose it's very difficult to tell when you're doing one project whether it's an unloved program. Um, I think the issue of a cultural connection between Ireland and Wales is, is much bigger than I can answer, but from my own experience, there's, I think someone just mentioned it, the connection, um, yeah, Lucy, Lucy just mentioned it, the connection in Ireland is possibly sort of leapfrogging over Wales and is very much towards London. Now, I don't, I, I would like to have a piece of research. It's interesting what you've, you've come what you have ascertained from your own research. So, I mean, for us, the people involved um, in Ireland working with Wales, it has been a voyage of discovery. I, I would say that over the COVID period and over the Brexit period, if we can call them periods, um, the awareness of Wales as a distinct entity with a devolved government and its own policies and its own um, identity has become, I think, it'd be very interesting to look at that as a piece of research, it has become much stronger to us in Ireland um, as distinct from um, the UK, um, just because it's dealing with these crises in, in its own way and faces its own individual challenges. Um, in terms of Brexit and the consequences um, for the programme or, or for the relationship um, of doing research of Ireland, Wales, I mean, there's an enormous amount to be lost if we can't continue to learn from what goes on in Wales. And I, maybe it goes the other direction where I'm, I'm, you know, you're always conscious when you're the partner in Ireland of how much wealth there of, of experience and of um, the policy, even, you know, the, the experience that was um, communicated at that conference this week. Um, I know, Sarah, you were at that as well. It, you know, there are some fantastic things going on in Wales that we just do not have in Ireland and we need to know about them. And there's really, it's such a perfect precedent. Very often we look to Scotland for precedents in the building area. You, you, you introduced me, Jada, as expecting me to talk about urban planning and architecture. And it may seem that this project doesn't have a lot to do with it, but has a huge amount to do with it. But it, um, in a lot of work in architecture and urban planning, in Ireland looks to Scotland as a very good precedent. In this area and coastal management, certainly Wales seems to be an extremely important place for us to learn from. And so I would be very worried that whenever Brexit happens and maybe this programme doesn't continue and there, there are less connections in terms of research across the, um, the border of the Irish Sea, that there's an awful lot to be lost. Siobhan, you wanted to come in. Yes, I was just gonna just gonna comment on the the um, on the connections between the Irish Sea. Is that that is kind of the the point of of the ancient connections project is is to um, is to revive that ancient connection, uh, literally. Um, so we have. Um, we have uncovered a lot of stories, and there, there was there was a heat, there was a such a strong connection between um, Pembrokeshire and and um, the east coast of of Ireland um, for you know centuries. Um, we have a, a little place along here called Mulgrove, which we used to be known that area used to be known as the um, 
the I land of the Irish. You know, a lot of Irish people lived here and there was a huge amount of trade. Um, so it's about it's about reviving that um, with the end goal on on creating a on creating more tourism to be uh, and, and, and more yeah, creating tourism and people cross um, visiting both both sides. So and and, and with and we project and people are utterly delighted to be connecting um, across across the sea um, with exchanges and it's so and people have, are finding it really refreshing actually to feel that connection so I you know so rather than in Wales looking yeah looking um, looking east you know looking towards England or London it's so refreshing to be looking west you know and um, yeah so it's just very positive from from our experiences. Great, Sarah. Do you want to comment uh, on uh, on this? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think I'd just echo what what Siobhan said. That reflecting on those those comments there, that actually the the historical connections in that with that the historical man, maritime connections have been incredibly strong um and and they come through some of the the discussions from the the various projects so there's an opportunity here to across all of the projects to promote those connections in a, in a meaningful way and and kind of rediscover the connections that it's not that they're new that we're only finding for the first time but they've 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 been there over over many many years over over the historical period it was interesting also reflecting on on lucy's comments about the connection between the clean and and um kerry because we, we are working in both of those areas and some of the similarities you know having done field work in both areas there really is a you know a striking similarity and i think one of the, the important things there that connects there is, is the importance of language um, in those communities and, and the Welsh speaking and the Gaelic speaking communities and engaging with those has been quite an important um, part of our considerations as, as well in terms of um, community activities. I, I think in terms of the, the Brexit issue, we, we started developing our project before the referendum and, and I kind of, I don't think we really thought we would be where we are now, but but here, here we are. And I think, you know, we are increasingly looking to um, looking west and, and we, we've learned a lot from our Irish partners as well. And, and I think we've, we've been taking the approach that, you know, we're really positive about continuing to work together in the future um, in whichever way we possibly can. You know, it would be great to see um, a future, you know, continuation of that Ireland Wales um, link in a formal capacity between the, the devolved um, Welsh government and um, and the Irish government. And I think, you know, that I think at a broader level, connections between institutions, between higher education institutions, between um, the different agencies that are involved, our stakeholders, I think we, we all, um, you know, we, I think we, we realise how much we've learned from each other so far and we wouldn't want to lose that. That's great. Um, Ifa, do you want to jump in one second and also you commenting on this? Yes, uh, I agree with the points about the, the links between the two countries being kind of as important as ever. And interesting to hear from Lucy about community members in Kerry perhaps being a little surprised at the, the, the Welsh partnership proposal. Uh, we haven't found that with our project. We When we've connected with um, people at the ports, they are familiar with their Welsh or Irish, um, what's the word, that they, that the people, people doing the similar things on the, on the other side of the Irish Sea, so whether it's a heritage group, they, most of them would have had some engagement across the Irish Sea and um, vice versa. So it's, I, I don't think that will go away, I think that will exist beyond Brexit, thankfully, I think that that bond will be there and I, it's interesting what you said as well, Jada, about the, about the water border being different. I was, it reminded me of, I was posting an Instagram picture for the project recently from Fishguard. Well, I wasn't in Fishguard, but I was tagging Fishguard as though I was there because this is COVID time. And I realized that Fishguard is 255 kilometers from where I am in Cork right now, which seems extremely close to me. Um, you know, it, Dublin is, is 220 or something like that. I, I know from traveling up and down. So it is very close. We are very close to, to one another. So um, yeah, I think that will, that will stay. Okay, Alan, I see that there is uh, a hand raised from Mike Pollard, so maybe we can activate his microphone and give him the stage. Hi, Mike. Hi, Alan. Hi, Mike. 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 Hi,
Hi, Mike. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I should introduce myself first of all. I, I'm Mike Pollard. I look after the management of European Territorial Cooperation Programmes, uh, otherwise called Interreg in Wales. So we're actually the managing authority for the Island Wales Programme. Um, I tuned into this on a very informal basis, I have to say, but it's been really, really fascinating hearing the different perspectives, both from a policy viewpoint, but also from our partners in the Island Wales programme. Uh, we work very closely with the Irish government and our operational colleagues in the Southern Regional Assembly on this programme. So I have to say it's, it's great to hear the positive experiences really of the presenters who are working on the projects um, and also the value that they attach to working together on these really important sort of shared challenges. Um, I was interested on the unloved comment because it's something we, we've sort of struggled with to a, to a certain extent, but we're not alone in that. I think European territorial cooperation programs um, actually disseminating the benefits to the public is a continuing challenge. And, you know, I think those people um, who are actually working on the programs understand the, the benefits, you know, quite clearly, but obviously uh, extrapolating that and getting that disseminated to the wider public, you know, is, is sometimes difficult because of the technical nature of the programs in some ways. But I would say we've worked extremely hard with the website, social media, um, and on events like this, really, to try and sort of extol the virtues of this, this sort of cooperation. And I think that's working reasonably well. But, you know, we, we won't rest on our laurels and we'll, we'll think creatively about how to get these benefits out in the public domain. But it's not an easy thing to do sometimes. So I just wanted to put in that little bit on communications, if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. And actually, well, if I just can comment on this one second. Um, generally, all the interviews I had uh, have all assessed how everything actually improved when, uh, um, when it was, uh, when the program was actually uh, put into line uh, with all the IT systems where I, so also the informations for partners and everything became a lot more accessible and uh, and that's I know it's a big uh, work that has been done by WEF uh, of course jointly with the Southern Regional Assembly but it's something that has been improved uh, in the last uh, uh, rounds of found when WEF took over as a managing authority so that's uh, that needs to be underlined as part of this work to actually disseminate and make uh, people aware of this uh, of this program. Um, okay, if uh, no one wants to ask another question, I this time would uh, uh, abuse my role as a chair um, to ask uh, actually to uh, to the panel something, um, well, it's a little bit outside the Brexit, but actually um, one of the main point that is always underlined when um, talking to people involved in the interreg programs in general, and not only the Ireland Wales program, but uh, this is also something that is usually underlined by the European Commission, is that uh, it is uh, hard to find uh, cross-border projects that are genuinely cross-border, even managed in a cross-border way, and that are genuinely cross-border. What's your experience in the project that you managed in terms of uh, what's the level of the cross-border work or the cross-border relationships that you are experiencing? <laughs> Yeah, do you mean in terms of, what do you mean by genuinely cross-border, I guess? What, what do you understand by that? Mm, for example, um, do you really work uh, on all the passages together? How the... Um, kind of uh, the yes, also, and uh, how the... How even the planning phases of the project was really cross-border in nature? Definitely for our project that, that I would say genuinely cross-border and in, in, in that case I think in terms of the planning it was planned 
by my colleague, project lead, Professor Claire Connolly, who will be speaking in, in at 2 p.m., I think, in this conference, so, so stay tuned for her. Uh, but she was working with project leads on the Welsh side, including Professor Peter Merriman in uh, Bristol University, uh, Marianne Constantine in the Centre for Advanced Welsh and Celtic Studies, and then colleagues from Wexford County Council as well. And I, I think from her description of that time, she was on the phone constantly, and it was a very collaborative effort to, to put together the project plan. So, so certainly it, it was kind of everything done cross-border from, from that perspective. Speaking for now, we have been kind of avid users of Microsoft Teams and now Slack as well. So really staying in more or less constant conversation across the teams on the Welsh and Irish side. And I would very safely say there, there is no split there. You know, we are one team, um, you know, we're, we're kind of, we have our organization level teams, but we have work packages where we would have members of, of different organizations, of different partners within those work packages. Uh, we would probably slightly, you know, in terms of dealing with communities, maybe slightly more dealing with Welsh on the Welsh side and Irish on the Irish side. But, but at the same time, I would be on the phone with people in Wales and vice versa. My colleagues in Wales would be on the phone with people in Ireland. And I would say there's a real, um, cross-border nature there which I'm very proud that we have achieved that and it's, it's actually well it's not even something we've achieved it's been integral from the start which is which is a lovely thing. Um, yes I, I have to um, say that we have the same same experience um, at the Ancient Connections project um, from the in initiation period back in 2014, which was very much between um, Amanda Byrne, I believe, at, in, County, in Wexford County Council and, um, and others, and Mike Kavanagh in Pembrokeshire County Council. I just have to say, actually, this is actually my third week, um, my first proper week by myself on this project because I'm covering um, Rowan, who was the previous um, project manager, she's now on maternity leave. So I'm not as up to speed, you know, being literally incredibly new. But I, I believe that was the case. And 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 now how we are actually delivering the project, we have um, um, myself, the project manager, is based in Wales, but we have a project officer in in Pembrokeshire and also in Wexford, and we're in continual conversation and um, uh, we, we try and manage the procurements as well so that they're evenly distributed. There is, there has, COVID has created a problem with, um, with procurements because we, it, originally we were, uh, say for instance, on, on some of the, some of the items, some of the um, aspects, having one company who would then go over, you know, one contractor and they would work both sides of the sea and this has actually been a real problem with lockdown and um, so we've we're having to reconsider our future procurements um, whether we have two contractors one either side because um, obviously you have to quarantine yourself uh, or self-isolate for two weeks <laughs> before you in Ireland so and um, so it's just very tricky that that aspect has made it has made it tr trickier Thank you very much, Siobhan. Philip, you wanted to say something? How do you know I want to say something? You're very because perceptive you have, online. Because you have your microphone unmuted, so I see you. Oh, okay, right. okay. <laughs> I always want to say something. Um, no, I think it's a really good question because it's it is it there are challenges when you're setting up a project from scratch i suppose reflecting on our experience and i was involved with dr karen foley who i think is on the call right from the beginning with this one that we initiated it and i suppose what we built on some established connections with wales that were already there and then had to make some new ones so the, the actual process of putting the um, team together um, involved cross-border collaboration from the start um, there were challenges. We we found that we went through a few different iterations in terms of a, a local authority or similar partner in Wales, but we were working with established connections, established relationships, and and groups and entities that had worked on this program before. Um, but I would say that the the whole process with the the proposal and putting together the different um, business plans, I mean, a cross-cutting theme is cross-border 
working cross border and you you know you don't have an option i mean it's it's got to be ingrained in there from the beginning what we find is that the project has to um it, it evolves and it matures as it, as it moves forward and we had started with work packages which all had a lead from one side and the support from the other country um and they have dissolved as um time has gone on and they've become absolutely cross-border working so rather than it being a, a work package it's turned into a working group um, so that has been influenced by the different personalities the different skills of the people that have been hired on the project and in some ways i think that's been one of the most rewarding things about the project is that you do bring new people on board who have their own skills and experience and um, they start working and developing relationships across the border on shared interests. So in some ways, our move away from the work package structure to a working group structure, where we would have a mix of people from different um, partners working on, say, something like the geo design and participatory mapping, or another group is working on virtual reality and augmented reality, that they, they are actually working very closely as groups. So in, in many, I suppose my point is that it's the structures that you set up in the project. Um, if they are in the right, if they are configured correctly, they they allow for and facilitate cross-border working. And that has certainly worked extremely well in this project. But I'm quite sure that there could be challenges um, in that in certain projects, but we we certainly haven't experienced them. Great. Sarah, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think I think that that's our experience too. That that cross border working's been embedded right from from the development of the project. But in terms of in the practical terms, um, because we bring different skill sets, um, and you know, um, our work in in Aberystwyth, um, is is you know working on the paleo environment and long term landscape change, and we're working across both regions to do that. And so. Um, you know, that involves collaboration with our Irish partners in, in terms of field investigations um, and, and similarly the, the um, Irish the Geological Survey of Ireland have been um, monitoring and surveying uh, in Welsh waters because that's their particular um, sort of programme. So, so it's the different skill sets that, that are working cross border as well as that, that joint working. So, um, you know, a lot of our outreach work, we try to do joint events whether that's I mean it's in some ways it's a little bit easier at the moment while things are online but um you know we've been trying to do that in person as well with sort of community events where we you know we you have um uh, you know joint joint ac activities and joint fields work and also joint training exercises as well um and and sort of that knowledge exchange I think is an important part of the, the cross-border um uh, you know aspect of, of the projects. Okay, Lucy. Yeah, I would I would echo very much what the other projects have said, um, and and I would say that I think this is the, the fourth project that I've managed under EU funding through UCC, and it's far and away the most genuinely collaborative, um, for all of the reasons that that the others have mentioned. Um, I think most particularly that it was structured in such a way that we just couldn't move forward without each other because the the learning that we have to do from each other is so clear. And, um, you know, there's just no one person in the project who could really carry on by themselves without truly collaborating with someone else. And I suppose something that's been very new um, for U the UCC is we've just hired someone who has never been to Cork before. Um, and he's entirely based in Wales and he's a full time employee of the university, which linking it back to the, the problems post Brexit might be a slight issue. We're really not sure yet. Um, but there are more plans for UCC to hire people entirely based in Wales. Um, so, I mean, it is down to that level that the tasks that are assigned to UCC can't even be completed in Ireland. You know, we need someone in Wales to, to complete those. So it's really, really, truly integrated. And um, there's definitely the possibility for the community work to become separate. Um, you know, that we're, we're dealing separately with communities in Ireland and in Wales. But I think, as Sarah has just said, with so much online communication, so many of our workshops can actually happen just once at the one time with both groups now. So while COVID has prevented me from traveling to Wales, I haven't met the partners over there in person yet. There are real benefits as well to so much of this online working being so normal for us now. So yeah, I would say it really is cross-border and, and we're, we're talking to each other all the time, so <laughs> yeah. 
but you see, that's great. And I was being purposefully provocative in asking that because I knew the answer would well, it, it, I knew that the answer would have been positive, but it's not the case for all the European Union interreg programs. And that's really a, a quality, let's say, of the interreg Ireland Wales program that needs to be highlighted. Now, to conclude in the last few minutes, I would ask to each one of you to please maybe saying three uh, sentences that you want to add about your own uh, programs and uh, maybe also including, I don't know, for coming, for coming event, uh, things that you really want us to know. Ifa. Three sentences, okay. Um, I suppose I didn't quite mention the upcoming uh, plans for the, for the project. So very much after Christmas, we'll be looking towards doing Port Fest events in spring, which we had such lovely plans to happen in person at the port. Um, and they were going to be great, but they will potentially need to happen online now. We're still planning them in person with our fingers crossed in the in, in the Welsh ports and in Rosslare, and we really hope they will go ahead. Um, but we also have a contingency for them to go online. Either way, they're going to be great events, uh, and certainly keep an eye out on our social media for, for publicity about that after Christmas. So that will be one per port, kind of March, April, May time for that they'll be happening then hoping to have some great speakers great creative events out there and some kind of family friendly stuff there too so very community focused and I think people will really enjoy those um, furthermore to, as, as we kind of move on later in, into the project we are also going to be having upcoming exhibitions from our artists as they produce their great work so we're yeah we're really excited to kind of bring those kind of more public facing events to the four so yeah keep our keep your fingers crossed we can have some in person for us <laughs> thank you Aoife. Siobhan well yes we're really looking forward to 2021 because we're going to just start putting on the events they will happen regardless um the first event um will be which i'll want to tell you about is going to be our, our creative camino and it's going to kick start the, the pilgrim idea I mentioned about um, four artists, two from <clears throat> Wales, two from Ireland, um, will begin from Ferns on May the 1st um, with a community launch event with lanterns and all sorts and they will arrive um, in St David's on May the 8th and they'll be joined by other pilgrims and there'll be a, a camera crew along the way to document it and the idea is that it will be a sort of trailer blazer drawing attention to the route and the beginning of it and um so yes we're going to make a little teaser trailer um this december in december to create anticipation for it so if you see that tra little trailer about our creative camino maybe you might like to share it for uh, share it for us okay thank you <laughs> great sarah Okay, so so yeah, so we're quite far on in the project now, and and, and I guess we've been using the, our downtime due to COVID to try to consolidate and synthesise some of our results, and so we're getting to the stage where you know more of our reports will be coming out about particular sites or management that kind of thing. So that that's sort of one aspect to it, but of course we are also in the same position as the other projects we've got lots of community events planned which have either been on hold or or sort of changed so we've got we've got a traveling exhibition which is um running concurrently in in ireland and and, and wales but but is all dressed up and nowhere to go at the moment so and um, we're hoping that that's going to be um we're going to be able to roll that out next year and have associated events along with the, the different destinations that 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 goes to um, we've still got field work plans that, that we've had delayed, and that includes more excavation and community involvement, particularly in Pembrokeshire and Kerry. So there might be some opportunities there to link with the other projects and, and you know, uh, and, um, you know, make real connections across those different interreg projects in the communities where we're working in in common. And so that, you know, for me, hearing more about the other projects and, and their um, priorities, you know, that that's, it's been really useful this, this morning to think about how we might move forward with some of the things we're planning and, and make more of them with, with um, more collaboration. Thank you so much. Philip, you want to say something? <laughs> You're muted. He cannot say something. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so, well, we, we are continuing with all of those projects. We're at a sort of, um, we're midway in a short project. Um, I suppose one thing that I'm very excited about in the project is working with Fingal County Council from the sort of planning side of things with geo design on these very difficult, in these very difficult emotive situations, um, such as we have in Portran. And so we are looking to work with them actively in a real environment with communities. And hopefully we are going to have an opportunity to do something similar in Wales related to Pembroke Dock. Um, and we will be continuing that um, Map My Heritage project in Pembroke Dock. Um, Pembrokeshire Coastal Forum are doing a lot of work with the community and particularly in, in schools. And that, is, as I say, has all gone online and they're continuing with that. And that includes a field trip online field trip. So they're developing techniques for actually doing field trips online. So there's obviously major drawbacks of doing it online, but there are some advantages. Um, you know, you can show different seasons, you can always get a good day. Um, but what you can't do is have serendipitous um, sort of activity, you know, you can't meet somebody randomly or find something and you can't smell things, you know, there's certain things missing. We are also working to see the um, opportunities presented by virtual reality, both in terms of immersive experiences. Um, so how can you actually help people understand uh, what has happened in the past and what is going to happen in the future? And does that help with behavior change? But also in terms of how you manage a project online so that you, you can overcome this inability to network or it restricted ability to network, et cetera, online. So we're developing all of those strands. Um, but I suppose the most important thing to communicate is that we are a pilot project. So we are focusing now, turning our, our attention to what parts of this project can extend into the future. And um, we're looking for opportunities for collaborations in the future in these areas. Thank you so much. Lucy. Got what I was going to say because I'm too busy listening. Um, <laughs> the first one is I noticed everyone else is sharing their social media channels and websites and um, these are very 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 soon to be released for our project so if you do see us coming up online please do like and share and follow uh, the live project once you can do so. Um, the other thing is yeah I guess we're, we're still at the beginning and we're very much at the stage of trying to build our networks and and get advice from people. So really, if, if anyone feels they've done what we're doing before or they'd like to, to discuss further, I think that's really the main thing that we're trying to do for the next few months is to talk to people, mostly locally, but also from other projects or organizations who, who would like to connect with us, um, either on the Irish side or the Welsh side or both. And um, so if anyone feels like they want to, please do get in touch. <laughs> so yeah, and... Um, if you'd like to talk about gene systems and Kerry with the CPAP project, I'm sure we'd, we'd have lots to say as well. So <laughs> thanks. So I really thank you so much uh, for all your brilliant intervention. That was amazing. And I leave back the stage to Jonathan, who will uh, say a few words before our lunch break. Thanks so much, by the way. Uh, thank you um, to all of the um, panellists, all of those representatives of those Island Wales programme um, uh, supported projects. Um, and I thought that there was so much by way of kind of fascinating intersections uh, in terms of the themes, in terms of approaches, uh, and then in terms of the kind of shared overcoming of the challenges represented by coronavirus and Brexit and so on. And I want to thank in particular um, Giada, Dr. Giada Lagana for chairing the session so wonderfully and flag again what I do think is a really important and valuable piece of, of research published recently by Giada and uh, colleague um, Dan Wincott at the Wales Governance Centre on the Island Wales programme. That brings us to a conclusion uh, for this, this morning's sessions. Um, oh, I want to flag, because it's just been pinned, that uh, Maya Thomas, our graphic recorder, has been hard at work um, giving visual representation to the, the discussion over the course of this round table. Those um, graphic illustrations of our discussions will be available in due course. There's a little bit of work that Maya needs to do um, to them before before they're released for public consumption, but we just wanted to give you a flavour of them um, as we go. Um, and they will be um, released 
um, with the illustrated report that we'll be producing on the back of this, um, on the back of today's conference. But anyway, that's that's it for now. We will um, reconvene at uh, just after two o'clock for the final uh, session of the afternoon. And thanks again to everyone that's spoken this morning and to uh, Giada and, and also to Mary for chairing uh, the two sessions so far. Uh, if there are any questions or anything over the, the lunch break, um, please just drop them in the, in the chat uh, directly to me. Um, if they're tech questions, they're better going to Alan, but I, I can forward them if need be. But uh, thanks very much and look forward to seeing, seeing you all again uh, just after two o'clock for our final session um, on uh, Irish sea cultures, um, past, present and future.